Well, welcome to class 111. Uh, tonight, we are going to be talking about uh, new physics in relation to the Baha'i faith, which is just an extension of what we began discussing the last couple of classes. Uh, but first, I want uh, to explain where we've come from and where we're going in so far as this class is concerned. And our beginning or restarting of this series of classes with class 101. Um, so let me uh, share my screen. And um, let's see. Okay, class 111 new physics and the Baha'i teachings. Um, where we are and where we're going. Uh, we began class 101, uh, those of you who've been following this, uh, with the discussion of the nature and purpose of imagery in the Baha'i text. Why do the prophets use this veiled language, this poetic language? And we discussed how those uh, images and symbols are constructed and how to decipher them. Uh, that led us to uh, the examination of the mind of God, and by that I mean God's purpose for humanity, because the overriding or overarching purpose for this sequence uh, from that class, that 101 up till now and for the next several classes, is discovering uh, the relationship between God's desire to be known and the structure of reality that he devises in order to bring that wish into uh, reality, in order to uh, uh, bring that w wish into fruition. And so uh, we have been, we first examined the idea of the uh, tradition of the hidden treasure, which is a very uh, explicit, uh, even though it's somewhat veiled, uh, statement of God's desire or the mind of God. What is it that God uh, wishes to create? Uh, we are now examining how that physical dimension of reality is the means by which he accomplishes this goal, and we've discussed already that in order to pre prepare us, to educate us for our destiny, which is to exist in the realm of the spirit, even though we acknowledge that our uh, spiritual self, our actual self, is already in that realm, uh, and as much as our essential self is uh, a spiritual reality, even though it's transmitted through the intermediary of the brain so that we can participate in this reality. And so uh, we looked at several times of the quote of Baha'u'llah, where he says, each of these dimensions are the exact uh, replication of the other. The exact counterpart is the word he uses. Uh, our next objective in this sequence, then, is to appreciate how this structure is not only a logical method for fulfilling God's purpose to be known and to be loved, or to establish a love relationship, as we have stated it. It is the perfect method. It's really the only method, but it is also the perfect in its uh, devising. We will then, after we complete this in about three classes, <clears throat> uh, we will then start using the tools for interpreting scripture that we learned at the beginning of class 101 and look at some of the specific uh, examples of how that can be usefully applied to understand the scripture once we understand and how that scripture applies to this purpose of fulfilling God's wish or God's desire to be known. So let me state, first of all, what is new physics? Well, we discussed last time the uh, what we call the uh, foundational methods or forces that organize these two dimensions of reality, the spiritual dimension and the physical dimension. And we said that 
and well, we didn't say, we cited those texts in the writings that say that love is the structural, is the organizing force that structures or organizing spiritual reality, and magnetism is the force that structures or organizes physical reality. We then got last week into the fact that uh, in new physics, at the beginning of new physics, the Newtonian idea, Newton's concept of every object attracting every other object according to its proximity and its mass, um, <clears throat> it has been or was done in, if you will, by uh, Einstein's theory of relativity which says that it is only an illusion of attraction that is brought about by the fact that the fabric of uh, space, the time-space continuum, as he calls it, uh, is actually bending space so that objects following that bend are attracted towards something that is making a dent, if you will, an impression in that fabric. Uh, and we'll look at that uh, in a minute. But new physics then begins to supplant what was called classical physics, the physics of Newton, uh, around the time of the michelson morley experiment that we talked about last class, uh, which examined uh, the concept of the ether, which Abdu'l-Baha says is the, uh, the uh, finest... Uh, condition of physical reality, the most ethereal, if you will. Uh, well, uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment, of course, stated that or discovered that there didn't seem to be any ether, or if there was, it had no effect on the speed of light. Um, so we go back to the relationship between the microcosm, the small world, and the macrocosm, the cosmos, the universe. From, in other words, between the world of quantum mechanics and the world of cosmology or the universe. There are, to go back to this relationship between what the Baha'i writings say about reality and the cosmos and what the physicists say, there are several things that we have discovered and a few more we'll look at tonight that there's uh, where there seems to be a conflict between the B Baha'i view and that of standard or accepted uh, theories of new physics. Uh, and uh, we're going to try to resolve those because as we know, uh, as we've said many times, and as the Baha'i writings say repeatedly, uh, there is no conflict between science and religion, or if there is, a, there may be conflicts between theories, there may be conflicts between individuals, uh, but the fact is that ultimately both are describing different aspects of a single unified reality. The first thing that most, and again most, not all, physicists in the contemporary world reject is the idea that there is a metaphysical reality, a metaphysical dimension. Uh, the second thing is the possibility of infinity manifest in reality. Is, the, is space infinite? Well, most uh, uh, cosmologists and astrophysicists, uh, especially those who still maintain the uh, adequacy of the explanation of the hot big bang, that reality, physical reality, began with the singularity that suddenly exploded and that we are part of that explosion uh, <clears throat> that happened about 4.5 billion years ago. That is, we in the sense of all of reality that we can see through our various telescopes and so forth. The third thing that most physicists uh, would reject, even those who accept some form of metaphysical uh, things like thought is certainly metaphysical, but they see no interplay between metaphysical dimension and physical reality. That is, even if some acknowledge that metaphysical reality exists in our thoughts, in our minds, even perhaps in our consciousness, 
that we cannot, uh, there is no interplay between the two. One does not affect the other in any observable or direct way. Uh, this, of course, was the problem from uh, Einstein's point of view of Newtonian uh, theory of magnetic attraction. And that is, if th there's nothing connecting the two things, how can there possibly be uh, any force exerted between them? Other than, of course, an electronic force, which means that it's not, uh, it's called what we see in this uh, uh, next to last one here, action at a distance is the general uh, category uh, that covers those, uh, the, the interplay. <clears throat> so a fourth thing that most physicists would reject is the existence of some cognitive being who has designed and are overseeing uh, the, re the reality. <clears throat> uh, again, if a physicist accepts the existence of God, it is usually a physicist who has uh, compartmentalized his or her uh, life into, I believe this about my spiritual life and I be believe this about physical reality. Uh, but most do not accept the existence of God. Certainly Darwin did not, uh, for example. Einstein is ambiguous at best about it. So action at a distance is very problematic, which is exactly what Newton, Newton was proposing, that these any two objects attract, e attract each other without any intervening force. They just na there is a natural attraction. Uh, and finally, a metaphysical source of human consciousness. This is a big one, and this is the most vulnerable one for new physicists. Uh, actually, new physics, which began at the turn of the last century, has really been supplanted by even newer physics. So uh, contemporary physics, we will say. Uh, one of, This is a problem that some scientists that we will cite as we go through the course tonight uh, say is one thing we really can't explain. And that is, as, as we've said many times before, the idea that there's some spontaneous creation of a consciousness and a will uh, and a self by the uh, spontaneous interaction of uh, the synaptic relationships of neurons in the brain uh, is a bit impossible to accept. It's not logical. It's really not feasible. We looked uh, last week at the Loi Aflaki uh, a, a bit, Aflakier. Uh, uh, by Abdul Baha, and um, so we're not going to go over this uh, passage right here, which is a statement by the research department of the house for the at the World Center, written to the House of Justice in response to the request someone of someone wanting to know about it and why it, uh, uh, what its value is and so on. Uh, and in particular, of course, it, as in his letter to Auguste Farrell, Abdul Baha in this work talks about the ether, are uh, saying, as we said last time, that every object in physical reality swims about in a medium of reality more refined than itself, uh, which, and presumably there's no end to this, ultimately, you get down to the most refined part particulate, which I believe we said last time was the quark, and then uh, one of the no uh, Nobel Prize winning physicists uh, uh, split the quark. Uh, very lovely individual whom I've met and talked to about the Baha'i faith. Um, these are the quotes that uh, the research department cited. We looked at the, some of these last time. Uh, from my brother uh, in his book, Minimalism, from Ian Kluge, uh, Baha'i Ontology, and another article by him, Further Explorations in Baha'i Ontology, and Stephen Phelps, who is a cosmologist by profession, very wonderful background, who worked at the World Center and is now uh, giving talks and so forth. Uh, uh, if you look online, you'll find some uh, very fine uh, 
discussions by him about quantum mechanics and its relationship to Baha'i concepts and theories, the Baha'i faith and atheism. Um, we looked at this last time, namely that a uh, uh, in the Loyaflak, the Tablet of the Universe, Abdul Baha states that there cannot be a void. An absolute void is impossible. So a void and a vacuum are not the same thing. And that is, a vacuum requires an area from which air has been removed, whereas the term void implies that absolutely every created or existent entity has been removed from some physical space. In view of this problem, the study that shed the most light on the issue of ether, at least for the remainder of the 19th century, was ironically the study of light itself, particularly the study of light as waves propagated through electromagnetic fields, or later, as it was discovered, it could also be studied as quanta, or packets, or photons, uh, particulates of light. So it can be examined both as particulates and as waves. Well, this is the statement that Phelps makes that I, I find very useful about uh, matter uh, and the uh, Abdul Baha's use of ether. So it seems that what we call matter and what we call spirit may not be so much an, an issue of different kinds of stuff, but rather spirit is what we call anything that is above us on the arc of ascent. And you remember we discussed the arc of descent from the will of God through the various uh, evolution of material and uh, uh, objects, and finally at the bottom of that arc, the very end of the descent and the beginning of ascent is man. Uh, anything that is in the direction of God, and matter is of course the opposite. They become relational realities, uh, adjectives rather than nouns. Abdul Baha seems to confirm this in one of his great tablets called the Tablet of the Universe, which bewilders us in the scope of its themes. He says, earthly and heavenly, this is a quote from uh, a translation that's online, but as I say, it has not been authoritatively translated. Earthly and heavenly, material and spiritual, accidental and essential, particular and universal, structure and foundation, appearance and reality, and the essence of all things, both inward and outward. All of these are connected one with, the, with another and are interrelated in such a matter that you will find that drops are patterned after seas uh, and that atoms are structured after suns in proportion to their capacities and potentialities. Universal and particular are in reality incidental and relative considerations. Uh, so uh, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but it's nevertheless fascinating that you look at an atom and it has the same structure as our solar system. Our solar system has the same uh, structure as the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy uh, as part of a galactic cluster, which has the same pattern of rotation with a center and so on. And then even the black holes are being studied as possibly the center of most galaxies uh, or um, <clears throat> galactic clusters. While such inferences quickly advance new science and quantum physics, at least one other conclusion regarding ether was clearly possible. The ether, like photon, the photon or the neutrino, is so refined as possess no classically measurable properties therefore either poses no resistance to photons of light. Furthermore, even though the experiment has since been repeated many times, always yielding the same result, no irreducible particle has been discovered. Now that's my writing from my book, uh, Close Connections. Like so many of the verities and observations made by Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l Baha, these recent conclusions about the likelihood of the existence of an ether demonstrate that their views about physics and science in general cannot be assessed by virtue of the historical context in which they lived and wrote. Namely, they were pre Persian prisoners under strict confinement without access to scholars or scholarly texts. Instead, the more their observations about society or evolution or physics or ethics are seen to be precisely accurate, 
the more difficult it will become for anyone to casually dismiss their ideas as arcane or misinformed because they had no access to Western scholarship and therefore could not possibly have known anything dealing with quantum mechanics and new physics. So in other words, the fact that Abdu'l Baha uses the term doesn't mean he was unaware of quantum mechanics, but he was speaking to uh, or, uh, an audience that did not have the capacity to understand those things. Furthermore, he was probably indicating with that term something more refined than or different, distinct from ether as it was commonly understood as the medium that transmitted uh, light and electricity. This is a nice quote from uh, Esselmont, who wrote Baha'u'llah in the New Era, one of the most outstanding and one of the earliest introductions to the Baha'i faith. In each drop of water are hidden oceans of meaning, and in each moat is concealed a whole universe of significances, reaching far beyond the ken of the most learned scientists. The chemists and physicists pursuing their researches into the nature of matter have passed from masses to molecules, from molecules to atoms, from atoms to electrons and ether. But at every step, the difficulties of the research increase till the most profound intellect can penetrate no farther and can but bow in silent awe before the unknown infinite, which remains ever shrouded an inscrutable mystery. And of course, this was written in 1923, and a whole lot has been discovered since then because while he was writing in the uh, uh, advent of and the ascendancy of new physics, since then we have discovered uh, the Hubble uh, concept of space uh, expanding and uh, the concept of the Big Bang was, I think, in 1927 when it was first introduced and so on. Uh, in some there is no void in the material universe, and every created entity is composite and exists in a sea of materiality more refined than itself. Were it otherwise, and this is my writing, by the way, not uh, authoritative, chaos would ensue if a photon uh, with its non-zero rest mass had is has non-zero rest mass. Then according to Einstein's theory of relativity, which says that mass and energy are interconvertible, in other words, either can become the other, its mass would approach infinity as the photon approached the speed of light, and it would thereby instantly destroy whatever it enlightened. Um, we thus conclude that as we approach infinity and refinement of particles, the particles become points of energy, and the microcosm the world, the small world of quantum mechanics, increasingly emulates the properties of spiritual reality, a reality in which nothing is composite, but it doesn't become spiritual reality, and that's important to understand. And yet the gap between these two expressions of reality remains. Materiality cannot ever become more refined without uh, ever changing, uh, excuse me, can become ever more refined without ever changing state and becoming spiritual because within the state of our condition of being material is the possibility of infinite refinement, our infinite, uh, well, let's get back to that. By analogy, a human soul is capable of becoming ever more or infinitely more refined and spiritual in character without transforming into another essence. We're not going to become uh, another category of being. We're, not going to, we're always going to be a human soul without ever transcending its nature as a human soul. Thus, because that which is material can mimic ever more acutely the properties of spiritual reality, of spirituality without ever becoming metaphysical, our study of this law of composition in the microcosm uh, uh, teaches us ever more completely the nature of reality as a whole. Now, what we're going to look at now uh, are two studies that seem to contradict new physics in so far as the action at a distance is concerned. These are both discussed more fully in my book, Close Connections. They are somewhat dated at this point, and yet the information we glean from them is still valid. So let me briefly uh, 
convey the essence of these experiments, both of which were double blind experiments done in a scientific manner that seemed to prove the possibility of human consciousness uh, having an impact on physical reality. The first one is a book called Recovering the Soul by Dossi, who uh, wrote many books on the subject of the reality of the soul and the human consciousness and its ability to affect physical reality. Uh, he speaks of a study designed to do just that, to investigate scientifically the effects of prayer on 393 patients admitted to a coronary care unit at San Francisco General Hospital. The well-known test, conducted by cardiologist Randolph Byrd, was designed so that the patients were arbitrarily and unknowingly divided by a computer program into two groups. So they weren't selected according to any criteria. It was done randomly by a computer. One that was prayed for by home prayer groups and another that was not remembered in prayer. The study was designed according to the most rigid criteria that can be used in clinical studies in medicine. Dossie writes, it was a randomized, perspective, double-blind experiment in which neither the patients, nurses, nor doctors knew which group the patients were in. The prayer groups were given the names of their patients, something of their condition, and were asked to pray each day, but were given no instructions on how to pray. Each person prayed for many different patients, but each patient in the experiment had between five and seven people praying for him or her. The results were that the prayed for patients were five times less likely to need antibiotics. They were three times less likely to develop pulmonary edema, and none of them needed intubation, an artificial airway as opposed to 12 in the not prayed for group who required intubation. As Dossi notes, had a drug or surgical procedure produced the same results, it would have been hailed universally as a medical breakthrough. Dossi himself concludes the results demonstrate that, quote, something about the mind allows it to intervene in the course of distant happenings. This would be action at a distance which would seem to suggest that there is no energy involved in prayer as we understand this term in modern science because the intensity of the cause, the prayer, does not diminish but diminish with distance. From a Baha'i perspective, we could conclude that there is an energy involved, but it is spiritual rather than physical in nature. Furthermore, if this gap can be bridged bidirectionally, one form of energy can affect the condition of a being extant in another in the other reality. In other words, we can pray for those who are, exist in the realm of the spirit. Though, of course, when we're doing that, since our soul or our consciousness is also in the realm of the spirit, it's not really bridging that uh, that gap literally. One of the more poignant and relevant observation Dossie makes alludes to the concept of the mind or the self in relation to quantum physics. Niels Bohr stated, and he is a quantum physicist and has mentioned a number of times, if you've seen the movie that's just come out uh, on Open, uh, Oppenheimer, uh, you uh, will hear, you'll see the character playing Niels Bohr uh, uh, mentioned and uh, it becomes very important in the quest to uh, uh, create the atomic bomb because uh, he was <laughs> one of the great minds in the field of quantum mechanics. He stated, we can admittedly find nothing in physics or chemistry that has even a remote bearing on consciousness. And his contemporary Werner Heisenberg, and Heisenberg, uh, again, very milestone figure in quantum physics, um, the originator of the uncertainty principle in modern physics, also put the matter bluntly. There can be no doubt, he said, that consciousness does not occur in physics and chemistry, and I cannot see how it could possibly result from quantum mechanics. Now, this last statement is particularly important because one of the explanations that a, some physicists would use 
to say that the event about the people praying for the individuals was did involve quantum mechanics, uh, particularly, I suppose, quantum entanglement, which uh, is something we don't have time to go into, but where you do have action at a distance, but it's connected. Dossi's most popular work, The Healing Words, The Power of Prayer and the Patient's Practice of Medicine, is a bit more rigorous than Recovering the Soul and is more satisfying to skeptics because it introduces intricate problems of understanding how prayer works rather than simply marveling that it has a demonstrable effect. For our purposes, the most interesting question it raises is whether or not there must be a God for prayer to work. In other words, is God the intermediary between our prayer and the effect it has? Uh, let me take a sip of tea, if you don't mind. Comparing the modern model of prayer with the traditional Western model, Dossie notes that according to the modern view, there is no need for God as an intermediary since prayer is internal, whereas in the traditional model, God is crucial as a necessary intermediary. But the study has a much broader interest and application, examining as it does different types of prayers, different modalities of praying, and various personalities among the suppliants. He also broaches the broader issue of the effect of love on healing, since in the final analysis, it is the concern for others expressed through the prayer that is the positive energy which introduces a healing process, not in a set form of meditation. In other words, prayer is the medium, but love or concern for another is the message or energy or power conveying through it. And of course, as a Baha'i, we would say, uh, but love is a force emanating from the creator. So God is involved and necessary in this process. Uh, here again, our analogy of electronic intermediaries comes to mind. We could use a phone to convey to someone our affection and concern. The expression of this affection would probably possibly have a remedial influence on the listener, yet we would not say that the person was assisted by a telephone, but rather by the emotion that was expressed in words that the electronic medium or intermediary conveyed. Again, this still does not uh, discount the Baha'i concept that that spiritual force that emanates from that soul through the telephone is as we looked at that wonderful passage from Abdul Baha at the beginning of our last class, love is the organizing force of the spiritual world, and we see it uh, uh, affecting the material world. And as much as that love is dispersed by the manifestations to us and through us to the rest of humankind. Now we come to the second uh, experiment which seems to confirm that action at a distance is possible, or to put it in terms that perhaps is more palatable to a physicist, that uh, action or interaction between the metaphysical reality that is the consciousness, and it can have an effect on reality. Uh, the, interestingly, the creators of this experiment John and uh, John and Dunn, and again, this work is, is somewhat dated as well, but it's still quite a valid experiment. Uh, they, uh, well, you'll see what, what their conclusion is. Another experiment in which a closed environment, a room, was constructed so that a row of chairs faced a wall that contained a large wall-sized version of Galton's desk a contraption similar to a pachinko game where balls descended amid a series of pegs and become distributed at the bottom. Now, what is a Galton's desk? Well, this is a diagram of it. And you can see like a pachinko game, the balls are lead pellets usually are uh, placed in the funnel at the top. They are then fall among all of these pegs. And the result is a bell curve at the bottom. And inevitably, that bell curve will result, and inevitably, they'll be equally distributed on either side of the center point. Uh, so, how did this? How was this experiment set up? 
The pachinko-like device was 10 feet high, six feet wide, instead of round shot, which is usually used in a pachinko game or Galton's desk. The balls were extremely light polystyrene balls, ping pong balls. Now, in most cases, the release of a great number of balls, whether they be shot or ping pong balls, is a predictable distribution at the bottom, a bell-shaped curve in which the majority of the balls are in the center and the remainder are distributed in increasingly fewer numbers in the slots to either side of center. In this experiment, the RMC, the Random Mechanical Cascade, as it was called, was arranged on the wall in such a way that observers could sit comfortably to watch the balls cascading from the top bouncing from peg to peg, and finally settling at the various slots at the bottom. After the release of the balls, the result would be as expected, the usual arrangement at the bottom of balls uh, in a bell-shaped array. The protocol for the experiment was exacting and intended to test whether the human beings sitting in these chairs could use conscious will to affect the outcome of this strictly physical mechanical event. Without detailing the entire protocol, we can safely conclude from the details set forth in the study that the experiment proved beyond reasonable doubt that human consciousness could and indeed did prove to affect the results. If the observers agreed to will that the distribution be shifted to the right, the bell curve was slightly altered so that it favored the right of center. A similar result recurred if the observers will the shift to the left. Data derived from this experiment conclusively demonstrated that the deviation from the norm was consistent, demonstrable, and repeatable. The participants were able to shift the norm, normal curve, the Gaussian distribution, to one side or the other, employing no influence other than their collective will. In short, the bridge between their metaphysical powers of will and the totally mechanical physical event had been demonstrated unless, of course, one could explain the influence as the result of physical properties of brain waves or quanta of energy influencing the outcome, which indeed is what Jan and Dunn concluded. But even if this could be proven, the question would then arise as to how the participants will their brain waves to emit this energy. In other words, will does not occur spontaneously from the brain. Our will, which is a metaphysical property of the soul or power of the soul, has to set the brain doing what we will it to do. Uh, interestingly, John and Don do not conclude their impressive report on the experiments by advocating some sort of metaphysical reality or even by asserting that a metaphysical power is the best explanation for these scientific demonstrations of the individual's ability to produce action at a distance through conscious will. Now, of course, Heisenberg uh, uh, and uh, would disagree with this. Uh, in so far as consciousness is, is concerned. Instead, they attempt to explain these abilities in terms of brain waves, quantum mechanics, and other materialist explanations. Quote, whichever of these wave mechanical options are applied, the model and the experiment agree that under certain cir circumstances, human consciousness can interact with physical systems to broaden their observable behavior beyond chance expectation. Well, um, I hate to to to, uh, to end this uh, here. So we will continue our discussion next week. Uh, beyond this, uh, as we go on to study the uh, nature of reality as it complies with the ability to God of God to construct a device for carrying out His wish, as revealed in the. Hadith of the hidden treasure, uh, that uh, reality is devised in a perfect method methodology for uh, utilizing uh, or for training us, as it were, in preparation for our individual ascent and changing, uh, uh, excuse me, 
and educating humankind collectively to create an ever advancing civilization uh, in so far as this planet is concerned. And no doubt there are unities beyond mere planetary unity uh, and the guardian uh, even alluded to such uh, unity.